This is the Apocrypha of Azazel podcast, and I am Azazel, the god of death. As you know, I'm currently reading through my journals, and I'm on book two. Book two is called The War of the Gas, and today I'm going to read you chapter 12, which, which is titled The Coming of the King. Now, the location is the Hall of the Double Axes there at the Rocky Pass Palace, and the timeline has now moved ahead. We are now at 299 years after Oz. In this chapter, I'm going to give you again a taste of what Hakdar was thinking. Shall we begin? And then one day, a new king was crowned. Hector Dervilles, the cone-haired Droka of the mountains. You're wondering how we got to this point? You're wondering what happened to King Baldur? How did Hector become king so quickly? Well, don't worry, my little lambs. I'll feed your minds soon enough. For now, just try to enjoy the party like the rest of Hector's guests. Be the good little sheep you are. A massive crowd of supporters filled the Hall of the Double Axes, that cavernous throne room inside the Troka's mountain stronghold at Rocky Pass. Yet, despite the festivities in his honor, King Hakdar was unsatisfied, grumbling under his breath at the frivolity of it all. I don't need some pompous event to endorse my rule. The new cone hair looked with contempt at the nigh uncountable tables, all overflowing with guests from everywhere in the eight kingdoms. The air was stifling, the aroma from the feast was noxious, uh. and the stench of spilt mead was nauseating. But the nobles in attendance continued to raise their glasses in Hakdar's honor, even as the king looked at them and thought, ha, they're forcing their enjoyment. They're still in shock at Baldur's death. They don't know what to expect from me. But that's good. Let them continue to wonder. They'll find out soon enough I'm a far different man than my father. Now, the mood at the king's table was a bit of a mixed bag. At Hector's right sat his brother Bran, perhaps next in line for the crown, should anything happen to Hector. Yet Hector eyed his younger brother and saw that he was too busy picking at his plate and pouting to notice him. And as he looked at Bran, he thought, There's a fat chance Bran will ever take my crown. He's naught but a lackey himself. He'd make the perfect pawn for someone else's power play, but I would kill my brother before he ever got the chance to make a move on me. Now, at Hector's left, it was a different story, for there sat his sister Hecla. Remember, it was Hecla who came up with the winning plan to install Hakdar on the throne, and it worked better than expected. As a result, Hakdar smiled at Hecla, captivated by the confident gaze she returned to him as he thought, Ah, my dear sister, you are enjoying my coronation party more than anyone else in the room, for surely you've gotten all you wanted and more as a result of our father's death and I'll make you my queen yet. Then, letting his gaze trail down to his sister's bosom, Hector's thoughts wandered even more. I'll pause for a second because you may be wondering, were Hector and Hecla getting intimate together? In a word, yes. Remember to note the dates, my friend. It's now 299 years after Oz. That's some four years after our last chapter, and more importantly, some four years after Hakdar first returned to court and Hecla tried to seduce him. A lot can happen in four years, especially between two sexually charged, power-hungry young adults secretly conspiring to take over the world. The union of Hector and Hecla was thus inevitable. It was their destiny to be together, and once I reunited them, I removed all other obstacles between them. After all, I needed them to work together to further my own designs. Over time, Hector stopped fighting his attraction to Hecla. He realized he both needed and wanted her, and he gave in to the fates, consciously walking forward into the future which was the very step I needed him to take to proceed. The rest of the feasters seated at the Conehair's table ran the gamut of emotions. Monty Redstone was there, but the Coinmaster General was as white as a ghost. Hakdar laughed inside as he looked at him. 
Let Monty be afraid. Let him wonder if Ortwin or Thork's fate awaits him, too. Monty will sing a different tune when war brings him riches beyond his imagination. At the opposite end of the spectrum were Merker and Heracles, the wise one and the king's new general, both in high spirits. Hakdar looked at them and smiled slyly as he thought to himself, Merker and Heracles are satisfied to see the candidate they'd long groomed for the throne take his place much sooner than either of them expected. Yet if they think they can control me like before, they're in for a rude awakening. As for the rest of the table, various other members of the royal family and six more lesser cone hairs and their queens, as well as a few other dignitaries, also sat at Hakdar's massive table. Hakdar eyed each of them in turn, yet most of them avoided his gaze when it fell on them. As a result, the king surmised to himself, These people mean nothing to me. Oh, they'll follow my lead, or be crushed by my boots. It matters not to me. Yes, you all can raise your glasses and smile at me, but we both know what's going on behind your eyes. And so the fake feast continued for hours more. Uh... The high priest Merker gave multiple blessings, and the crowd, to include all the other cone hairs and military men, yes, they all took a knee to honor Hakdar as the high king of all their people. Countless false friends continued to raise yes. their glass in Hakdar's honor. The new cone hair Droga allowed this charade to continue for as long as his patience would allow. For besides the surprise he was planning to unleash on all the guest presents, he knew that word of his soon-to-be legendary royal decree would get back to his rival, Garrick the Golden Hand, Marduk of the Durka. And Hakdar smiled as he thought to himself, Garrick will soon eat his heart out in jealous fear, knowing that I am coming for him now. And that thought drove Hakdar over the edge. As, unable to wait any longer, the newly crowned Conehair rose from his seat and began to climb upon the gigantic oak table, to the surprise of nearly everyone in attendance. And as he made his way upon that table, Hakdar pulled up a mysterious long velvet bag with him. Although such displays of reverie were, were common among the Droka army, most of the guests present had never seen a High King act in such a way, for during his long rule, King Baldur had always been more reserved in public. And so, while many in the crowd had not been sure what to expect of Hakdar prior to coming to this feast, the sight of their confident Conehair willing to display himself in such a manner immediately triggered positive vibes in the mass psyche causing them all to let loose with a raucous applause for the king. Hakdar let them enjoy the scene for a moment or two, and then, after a nod from Merker and a smile from Hecla, the king opened his bag and pulled out a bejeweled battle axe, one that quickly glittered in all directions, and it was then that he finally loosed his revelation. My brothers, I have been to the Well of Wisdom! The Ragnarok is at hand, and we shall soon wipe clean the accursed Dirk from Mittengarten. The crowd abruptly stopped cheering, and everyone stood with their mouths agape, not sure what to do next, just as Hakdar expected. The Ragnarok has come? Many whispered in hushed breaths, taking their seats as their knees buckled at the thought. As I watched them from afar, I couldn't help thinking what a comical disgrace the Droga nation had become. Baldur's long tenure of peace had allowed their armed forces to grow soft and weak. But for a group of people who foolishly believed that they had invented war, it was amusing to see these warriors now scared at the sudden prospect of it. I'm sure their god Roki would have been disgusted to witness these scared fools, had Roki cared enough to show his face again. Meanwhile, others in the crowd were wondering, is this the time of the last battle? Fearing that their people's myth might actually be true. Look at that weapon he holds, countless more pointed. Surely there is magic in that blade. Hakdar let this rabble go on for another moment more before, SILENCE! Immediately, quiet reigned even more than before, for everyone cowered before their new cone hair. 
and as well they should. For Hakdor stood an impressive five feet tall. That's a full hand higher than most of the others there present. And Hakdor was bursting with confidence. Standing there upon the banquet table on that night, Hakdor really was a magnificent sight. Dressed in his black crystal chain mail, with a short royal blue cape at his back, and with an awe-inspiring weapon in his hand, believe me when I say that Hector Dercles surely looked the part of mythical warrior. And yet, in spite of Hector's commanding presence, it was his battle axe that captured the attention of all. Hector held the blade aloft, and everyone could see that it was an iron-hafted broad axe. And it was a beauty to behold. Its shaft was decorated in golden plate upon which were embossed Droka runes of power in tribute to their legendary heroes Ajax and Volzum. The blade itself was made of carbonized diamond and its keen edge had been specially tempered never to dull. And opposite the axe head, the reverse side was flared into two cruelly curved four-inch barbs. Why, one look at this weapon would be enough to let anyone know that its bearer meant business. Yet if the blade's appearance alone was not enough to scare off his enemies, then it should be noted that Hakdar had something else to turn the tide of war in his favor. For his axe had been infused with the divine gifts of limitless endurance and unmatched power. As a result of this magic, Hector Dercules was now armed with the most powerful weapon the world had ever seen. And I wonder where he got it from. Any guesses? Oohs and ahs came from the countless warriors in the crowd, while Hector explained, This battle axe will be the key to our victory over the Dirk, for each of you shall be armed with one just like it, and once equipped, there will be no way our enemies can stand up to us on the battlefield. The crowd cheered at this news, and someone called out, My lord, what do you name this awesome blade? At that, Hector smiled wide. It shall be called the Gas! And then, pointing to the brave warrior who had spoken up, Hakdar said, Are you ready to become a gas wielder too? And at that, Hakdar reached into the velvet bag beside him and drew out another gas. This second blade was identical to the first in appearance, although there was one crucial element that Hakdar failed to mention. For the other ghast did not possess the special magical elements that Hakdar's weapon did. As you can imagine, for obvious reasons, this was a fact Hakdar did not publicize. Meanwhile, the warrior who had spoken up rose from his seat and Hakdar tossed him the second non-magical blade. For his part, the warrior caught the blade by the shaft and the room exploded in celebration. Hakdar then shouted over the crowd, Brothers, hear me! This is a time of change! Don't you see? With an army of ghast wielders, we no longer have to remain cooped up in these mountains at the mercy of the Dirk. Instead, we can venture to the world above, and we can take control of the Blackwood Forest for ourselves. What say you to that? Although most of those present hadn't fought in any battles in their lifetimes, war was a concept long ingrained in, in the blood of the Droka, especially when it came to destroying their Durka rivals. As a result, Hakdar's words soon caused cheers from the crowd that filled the room. Now, I should note these were hollow cheers from paper warriors who really had no idea what quote-unquote war really is. The people were just cheering for perceived glory, and they didn't have any idea of the coming sacrifices and atrocities that would be required to attain their precious glory. Oh, but don't worry. I plan to make sure they would know those atrocities soon enough. <laughs> In any case, the paper warriors continued to cheer, Death, Death to, the, to dark. the Dark! And, We want Blackwood! We want Blackwood! We want Blackwood! Yes, these and more were chanted loud and long. Again, Hector called out above the din, We are about to make history, brothers! For this will become the time when, when the scribes of Chaldea shall enter into our Droka Chronicles as the War of the Gas! 
and gripping his ghast with two hands, Hakdar then took a mighty swipe at the air, and his axe produced a brilliant flash as it sliced like lightning through the ether, the blade literally screaming in shoots as it clove through the haze. Yet suddenly the king stopped, and pointing a finger to the crowd, he roared, Ah, but there's one more thing, perhaps the most important of all. And here Hakdar licked his lips at the thought. I promise you, brothers, that the Ragnarok will not end until Lord Garrick himself has been delivered to us. And when we come upon the Marduk, we shall stamp our boots with vengeance into his throat. And at that last... Hakdar raised his own black-booted foot high into the air, and then he kicked viciously down with a blow so powerful that the table itself was shattered beneath him. Those at the high table had their chairs turned back in all directions, and as the dust settled, it was Hakdar alone who stood in the center of that splintered pile. Yet while the broken wood might have obscured him from the view, the glittering ghast was still visible, high in the air above Hakdar's head, a shining beacon for all to see. And from within that tangled maelstrom, Hakdar ruled out the warrior mantra, Challenge not the Troka, for Rocky is our god! At that, all the room exploded in a frenzy as Hakdar's people pounded upon their own breasts in pride, echoing, Challenge not, not the, the Troka, for Rocky is, is our god. god! And at last, Hakdar smiled as he thought, It's good to be the king. Wait till they see what I will do next. <laughs> well, that was quite a chapter. I know you've got questions, and I'm going to answer them. You wonder, how did Hakdar become king? What happened to Baldur? Did Hecla's plans really work? Well, don't worry, my little lambs. I'll answer all those questions and more in the next chapter. Until then, I encourage you to go to my website, apocryphaofazazel.com. Sign up for my book club so you can be notified when new podcast episodes are released. And if you can't wait to listen to the episodes, why not read my books right there on my website right now? All the books are there, apocryphaofazazel.com. And as always, I want to give a shout out to YouTube's free audio library for the music of this podcast, freesound.org for the sound effects and trans transistor.fm for hosting this podcast. Until next time, I'll throw it out there once again. If you want the god of death to visit you, you need only call my name. Azazel, 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 and I'll be there. Ha <laughs> ha.